Hello, and welcome to this year's fifth COVID-19 webinar co-sponsored by AOPO, AST, ASTS, CST, ESOT, ISHLT, NATCO, the Transplantation Society, and UNOS. It's hard to imagine that 18 months ago, we would still be in this position, but certainly, it's time to now update. We have a lot of great information. This has been a labor of love by so many organizations as represented on this slide. And I'm delighted to welcome you to this fifth webinar. My name's Emily Blumberg and I'm a transplant ID doctor at the University of Pennsylvania. And I'm going to turn the session over to Dr. Luciano Patena to introduce himself and welcome our first two speakers. Thank you, Emily. Uh, welcome, everybody. Uh, it's, uh, again, a pleasure for me and an honor to be part of this uh, multi-society uh, event. And I wish to thank uh, uh, AST to putting this together and to uh, engage with, uh, with ISOT, who I'm representing as president, and with the other societies that are represented here. So for the fake sake of time, uh, I would like to, to uh, go straight and introduce the first session, which is about uh, the use of COVID positive donors and we are going to hear the uh, US experience and then the European experience. So the first speaker will be Ricardo Lajolza, who is Associate Professor at the Division of Infectious Disease uh, at the University of Texas Southwestern. And the second speaker is uh, Paolo Grossi from uh, the Infectious Disease Department, Professor of Infectious Disease at University of Varese uh, in Italy. So I would like to invite uh, uh, Dr. Lajos to give his first presentation. Oh, thank you for the introduction and the opportunity to speak today about the COVID-19 positive donors, the U.S. experience. Next slide, please. So let's speak about what is required for donor-derived COVID-19 to occur. From lung donors to lung recipients, we need viable viral particles in the respiratory tract. Epidemiological and microbiological studies with the initial strain describe that viable viral particles are unlikely to be present beyond 21 days after the onset of infection. At the same time, the ideal timing for lung donors uh, after COVID-19 is unknown. What about non-lung donors for non-lung recipients? Two scenarios may lead to donor-derived COVID-19. The first one is viable viral particles in the blood. A systematic review found a pooled estimate of RNAemia in patients with COVID-19 of 10%. However, this was not associated with the presence of viable virus in the blood. The second scenario for donor-derived COVID-19 is viable viral particles in the tissue allograph. There's conflicting data regarding the presence of viral particles in non-lung tissue in autopsy studies. And again, I want to emphasize that the studies have focused on those dying from severe COVID-19. Next slide, please. There's a series of scenarios for SARS-CoV-2 SARS positive donors. I will just focus on those that test positive at the time of donor evaluation and do not have a history of COVID-19. So let's start with those that test positive in the upper respiratory tract. The CDC has investigated 40 COVID-19 potential donor-derived transmission events from uh, March 2020 to March 2021. Of those 40 events, three are relevant to this scenario. The donors tested positive for SARS-CoV-2 in an upper respiratory tract sample and did not have the history of COVID-19. There were five recipients for, there were five non-lung recipients and none of them developed a uh, clinical evidence of SARS-CoV-2 infection at 45 days post follow-up. Koval et al. have also published in this scenario. They describe five donors. None of them had a known history of COVID-19. One of them has an exposure, had an exposure less than 45 days prior to donation. 
it is important to mention that with the exception of one donor, they had the combination of positive and negative results prior to donation. The cycle thresholds for those that had one uh, were between 31 and 41. There were 10 kidney recipients from these five donors. None of them developed uh, clinical evidence of SARS-CoV-2 infection at fault. Next slide. Thank you. Let's speak about those that test positive for SARS-CoV-2 in a lower respiratory tract sample at the time of donation and did not have the history of COVID-19. Again, the CDC investigations help us. There's three events that are relevant to this scenario. The donors tested negative for SARS-CoV-2 in a upper respiratory tract sample, and then subsequently, either retrospectively or at the time of implant, they tested positive in a lower respiratory tract. The three lung recipients unfortunately developed donor-derived COVID-19, but the six non-lung recipients did not have any clinical evidence of SARS-CoV-2 infection. There's also data from our colleagues in Italy that will be pre uh, presented in the next session regarding this topic. The OPTN has been monitoring the implications of the SARS-CoV-2 lower respiratory tract emergency policy. From May 27th to August 31, there has been a total of 20 organs transplanted from donors that tested positive in a, a lower respiratory tract sample. The utilization rates of these donors that test positive in the lower respiratory tract sample mirrors those that uh, test negative. There hasn't been a, uh, any reports of potential donor-derived transmission events during that time frame from these donors. Next slide. And, uh, to take the, the decision to take a SARS-CoV-2 positive donor without the history of COVID-19, it's a complex multivariable clinical analysis. And we need to take into account the medical urgency of the candidate, the risk of mortality on the candidate of the wait list, the risk of transmission of SARS-CoV-2 to the OPO team, recovery team, as well as the recipient. We also need to take into account the possibility of a COVID-19 associated allograft injury. And we also need to acknowledge the unknowns regarding the long-term outcomes from these donors. Next slide, please. The OPTN has um, summarized the evidence from SARS-CoV-2 positive donors. This document has been developed in collaboration with uh, members from AST, ASTS, AOPO, CDC, HRSA and DTAC. Uh, the information is published in the UNOS website and is being currently updated uh, quarterly. There you can see the different scenarios for SARS-CoV-2 positive donors. Uh, this is the end of the presentation. I will uh, now, uh, Paolo Grossi will be presenting the European experience. Thank you very much to the organizer for this kind invitation. So I would like to share the Italian experience. So we have very limited time, so I cannot uh, go over all uh, uh, the European experience. So, but the problem with COVID in Europe that uh, as we can see in this slide, so many uh, European countries had a, a significant decrease in the number of uh, organ transplants. So, almost less than 20% uh, in, uh, in Spain compared to 2019, 25% in France, 26 in, in UK. In Italy, we had almost 10% uh, uh, reduction. Uh, in Germany, there was a less reduction, 6.6. .6, uh, and uh, next slide, please. But what, what we decided to do in order to keep the, the transplant activity ongoing in, in Italy was to uh, expand the donor pool, use, starting using donors with uh, past uh, COVID-19, so patients who, who had resolved COVID-19 and donors with former COVID-19 at least 14 days from clinical recovery and virus clearance documented by two negative PCR tests 
24, 48 hours apart and negative BAL because we, we, we perform BAL in all donors before organ procurement, may carefully be assessed for donation and ultimately be considered eligible for donation if no permanent end organ damage resulted from COVID-19 and appropriate donor organ function is confirmed. What was important is to inform and discuss with the uh, candidate the recipients about the potential risk associated uh, with use of these organs. So next slide, please. And so, uh, so far we performed 30 transplants from 10 uh, donors uh, with uh, past uh, COVID-19 infection and none of them had any uh, transmission, any problem related to the use of these organs. It was liver and kidneys, uh, hearts. Uh, and so about 30 transplants from these uh, uh, donors have been performed in Italy uh, so far. Next slide, please. And the next step was to use uh, COVID positive donors uh, in uh, uh, recipients with a history of resolved COVID-19 who were in severe clinical conditions. So we started seeing uh, donors with no history of COVID-19 that have been found to be SARS-CoV-2 positive in the BAL and nasopharyngeal swabs at the time of uh, organ donor evaluation. And so uh, we performed so far, starting from November 2020 uh, up to the end of September, so we have performed 23 transplant in patients uh, with severe clinical conditions and the recent history of uh, COVID-19 assuming the presence of protective immunity due to the previous uh, uh, infection. Uh, uh, what is important to underline that two are transplants that have been performed in seronegative recipients, so in recipients who didn't have any history of, of COVID-19. And next slide, please. And th this experience, the first 10 uh, transplant with the longer follow-up have been uh, rec very recently published on the on AJT. If I may have the next slide. Next slide, please. So uh, uh, the result of the first 10 liver, uh, liver transplant uh, with uh, such donors within an Italian multi-center series and only two recipients had the positive molecular test at the time of liver transplantation and one of them remained positive up to 21 days post liver transplant, but with very high CT, we saw most likely not uh, uh, replicating virus. And none of the other eight recipients was found to be SARS-CoV-2 positive during the follow-up. And we, we checked for the antibodies against SARS-CoV-2 at, at liver transplantation, and these were positive in 80% of the recipients, and 71% of them showed neutralizing antibody expression of protective immunity related to the recent infection. Uh, in addition, testing for SARS-CoV-2 RNA on donor's liver biopsy at transplantation was negative in 100%. So apparently the liver tissue was completely uh, 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 free from, from uh, virus, uh, suggesting a very low risk of transmission with uh, liver transplantation. Next slide. So this is a very busy slide, almost impossible uh, to read, but uh, th this donor died of uh, trauma or cerebral vascular accident or meningitis or other causes unrelated to, to COVID. And the positivity in, in this uh, 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 nasopharyngeal swab or uh, BIL was uh, uh, detected at the time of, of donor uh, evaluation. But what is important is that none of, of, the, of the recipients developed any problem related to uh, COVID-19, to SARS-CoV-2 uh, infection. So next slide, that is my last slide. So Italy is the first Western country interested by the COVID-19 pandemic and has paid a very high price in terms of death, and health professionals, and particularly those working in the ICU, have been exposed to a dramatic situation. However, despite this, organ donation and transplantation has continued with the reduction of the overall activity of about 10% compared compare 
to the previous years. The CNT, the National Center for Transplantation and the Italian Transplant Network has been able to guarantee the transplant activity with a high level of safety of organ transplantation during the pandemic and new opportunities have been successfully uh, explored. So using organs from donors with uh, 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 resolved or uh, uh, active COVID-19 in informed candidates with SARS-CoV-2 immunity might contribute to safely increase the donor pool. Thank you very much for your attention. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Paolo and Ricardo. Uh, so uh, we are now moving and thank you in particular for being uh, on time since we have a very busy, uh, busy schedule tonight. We have time for uh, some questions. There are a lot of questions coming in. Uh, uh, I just want to ask uh, um, a question. Probably both of, of you can respond. I would ask uh, first uh, Paolo because he presented some specific data and also the Italian protocol, but I also would like to hear uh, Ricardo's opinion on that. So both of you show that somehow, is it possible to use uh, COVID positive donors or donors who have been positive for COVID uh, shortly before uh, the donation? And of course we are talking about uh, donors who have not died because of COVID, but they are uh, positive in, in, in that, uh, in that uh, event. Mm, uh, Paolo, you mentioned that uh, these donors can be considered or as for standard protocol have been considered for recipient who have uh, uh, um, recovered from COVID, but not for a uh, recipient uh, who have been vaccinated against COVID. So uh, what is your, your opinion and the current uh, uh, protocol in this, uh, in this scenario? So are we considering uh, uh, more li liberal uh, donation for vaccinated recipient uh, or not? Well, actually, uh, th the problem is that the patient with uh, end organ disease, uh, whatever is the organ involved, in general, have a, a lower rate of response uh, to vaccine in general, not specifically to the uh, COVID-19 vaccine. And therefore, so, so far, I was a little bit reluctant to offer these organs to candidates with uh, a vaccination history uh, unless there is a documented neutralizing uh, antibodies uh, presence in, in these recipients. Uh, this might change in, in, in the future. So when we started using these organs, uh, uh, we, we try to be the, the safest as possible. So trying to offer these organs only to recipients with an immunity that was related to a, a, a natural uh, immunity from, from a, a, a true infection they, they had in the past, because this is what in general gives the best uh, protection to the recipients. Uh, we're looking also, uh, talking, talking about the liver, but I think the same thing could be for kidneys, uh, that there is no evidence of any RNA, regardless of, of, of uh, viable virus, but RNA in the tissue, I, I think we could uh, extend uh, the use of, the, of these organs also to uh, vaccinated recipients, uh, provided that we, you have a documented response uh, to the vaccination. Well, I think I have a very similar take. What I would say is that the uh, pandemic has changed uh, transplantation in multiple ways, but something that remains unchanged is the mortality of the candidates on the wait list. And we have to consider that at the time of evaluating these donors. Like I said, it's a pretty complex uh, multivariable analysis in my mind that needs to take into account the donor age, donor comorbidities, date of onset, uh, testing results, uh, CT values, uh, if they're available, knowing their limitations. Um, what we may or may not know about the end organ COVID-19 uh, allograph injury and uh, the unknowns of, of long-term outcomes. I think, uh, as I alluded in my first slides, it, it seems that the highest risk is for the 
long recipients. Uh, for the non-long recipients, it appears uh, currently based on, on the clinical studies, what we know of the biology of COVID-19, that the risk may be quite low for the non-long recipients. We truly don't know what the risk is. In that regards, if a candidate is, is, uh, doesn't have a history of COVID-19 and, one of the, and is at high risk of mortality and one of these donors become available, I think that the benefits of using uh, these organs outweigh the benefits because the mortality, again, is quite tangible. At this point, the risk of transmission, although unknown, appears low for non-lung uh, recipients. Yes, I, I totally agree. With the lungs, I think it's... It's too early to, to, to use. Uh, so in Italy, we just allow the use of heart and livers, and we are moving now to a protocol for, for kidneys, but we are not considering lungs. Maybe in the next future, if you learn more, this could be feasible, but not right now. Yeah, at our center, we have used uh, lower respiratory tract positive for unvaccinated recipients with very high MELT scores and, and for the reasons I described. Thank you. So um, you both described using these organs for specific recipients. And I'm wondering, how would you manage your recipients after? And does that depend on whether they have a positive lower or upper tract? specimen. So the two questions I'd like you to address are, would you give any specific anti-COVID therapies, either monoclonal or antivirals after the transplant? And would you modulate your immune suppression? So Ricardo, we'll let you take that first and then Paolo. I think, um, again, the, the tangibles are with regards to the induction and maintenance immunosuppression is, is the risk of rejection. I think to me, that is quite tangible. The risk of donor-derived COVID-19 for non-lung recipients, again, at this point, it hasn't occurred. It doesn't mean that it won't occur, but it will be, uh, seems to be small. For that reason, I think I will, uh, my personal opinion will be to keep the same induction and maintenance immunosuppression, given the tangible risk of, of rejection. With regards to the management, I think, again, complex multivariable analysis, I think it, it takes into account many of the variables that we have spoken. I would say that for heart uh, recipients, the, the risk of volume overload is also there with the infusion of monoclonal antibodies. Uh, when we have used them uh, at my center, we have decided not to, to use uh, monoclonal antibodies again, because our perception was that the risk of donor-derived uh, disease was low. At the same time, I'll have to acknowledge that the ultimate, the uh, the ideal approach is still unknown. Yes. Um, Hello, what do you think? Yes, we did the same. So in, in Italy, uh, this, the uh, exactly the same protocol of induction and maintenance treatment used for the regular uh, uh, recipients of, of standard donors have been used. So no modification and no uh, antiviral. Uh, uh, prophylaxis or, or treatment because none of them develop any infection. So I don't think there is any need, uh, again, for non-lung uh, uh, organs. So we keep exactly the same. Okay, thank you. So uh, I don't know, Emily, I think that we are just in a, in a perfect time to and over the uh, the session for the other for the the, the word to the other session about uh, about vaccine. Great. Okay, so we'll turn this now over to Dr. Dipali Kumar, who is the president elect of AST, to introduce the next session. Thank you very much. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much, Emily, Luciano, Paolo, and Ricardo, for that fantastic discussion. We're going to. Um, switch gears now uh, to vaccines. And uh, just to start off, I'll introduce myself. I'm Dipali Kumar. I'm a transplant infectious disease physician at the University Health Network in Toronto. And my co-moderator for this session will be Marcus Pereira, who is uh, infectious diseases at uh, Columbia University. And um, we will then start off. We have five talks in this session, which will go one after the other. I'll introduce the the panelists uh, now. 
so our first panelist will be Dr. Saima Aslam from University of California, San Diego. She'll be talking to us about effectiveness of two dose vaccine, followed by Dr. Atul Humar from University Health Network in Toronto, who will talk about three doses of vaccine. And then um, Dr. Robin Avery from Johns Hopkins, uh, we'll discuss monoclonal antibodies and other ways to protect transplant patients. After that, we'll have Dr. Mike Eisen from Northwestern, who will talk to us about the pros and cons of serology. And then uh, lastly, Dr. Lloyd Brown from Rutgers New Jersey Medical School, who will talk to us about vaccine mandates. And then after that, we will have uh, a discussion. So uh, I'll now invite Dr. Aslam to start. Okay, well, hopefully you can hear me. Uh, thank you very much, uh, for both for the introduction, as well as the invitation to speak at this webinar. Uh, could you move the slides, please? Disclosures are listed here, and then if you can move on one more. Thank you. So there are a number of studies assessing the immunogenicity of the mRNA vaccines in the solid organ transplant setting, and some of these are shown here. These studies look at the IgG response to the spike protein, and or the receptor binding domain of the spike protein. Uh, some studies also look at viral neutralizing assays as well as T cell responses uh, in, in a few of these. So in general, antibody response is quite variable as you can see here, but in the largest studies noted here, about a third to half of patients have detectable antibodies. I'd like to point out the uh, Chavro et al. paper from France uh, which studied 101 kidney transplant recipients on bilatacept, and only 5.7% of these had detectable antibodies. And then the Havlin paper from the Czech Republic, which consisted of 48 lung transplant patients, none of whom had detectable antibodies after two doses of mRNA vaccine, compared to about 85% in those that had COVID. The T cell response has been measured in a few studies only, and again, seems quite variable, so ranging from 5% in the Bilatacept study to 80% in the Herrera et al. paper from Spain. It's important to note that detectable T cell response can be present in the absence of detectable antibodies. And this has been shown in several papers listed here, including the Hall paper from Toronto, the Herrera paper from Spain, and the Havlin from the Czech Republic. There have been a number of risk factors that have been identified uh, associated with suboptimal immune response. And this includes the, uh, vac uh, uh, the vaccine recipient being of older age, use of antimetabolites at the time of vaccination, B cell depleting agents, use of high dose steroids, higher CNI levels, increased creatinine as well as increased C reactive protein. A few studies do note that there's a less robust response when transplant recipients have received the Pfizer BioNTech vaccine compared to Moderna. And there's also a suggestion that um, from the studies that I've quoted here as well as others, that cardiothoracic transplant recipients have a less optimal response compared to abdominal organ recipients. In particular, lung transplants have a very minimal response. Could you move on? So even though immunogenicity data is suboptimal, real life clinical effectiveness studies do show a benefit for transplant patients that are vaccinated versus those that are unvaccinated. So this is a paper from the UK, a Ravenin et al. studied about 48,000 transplant recipients and looked at mortality related to COVID-19 in these patients. And they found that fully vaccinated recipients had COVID-related mortality of 7.7% compared to the higher 12.6% in those that were unvaccinated. Next, please. And at UCSD, we retrospectively took a look at our uh, solid organ transplant recipients and among 2,100 or so patients, we noted that the incidence of COVID-19 was significantly reduced, so almost 80% reduction in the risk of COVID in the vaccinated patients versus the unvaccinated patients. Next, please. So despite clinical benefit, vaccinated solid organ transplant recipients do have a higher risk of breakthrough infection than the general population. So this is a study of almost 18,000 fully vaccinated solid organ transplant recipients at 17 centers. Uh, breakthrough infection occurred in less than 1%. So there were 151 breakthroughs in this study. Uh, about half of these breakthroughs were associated with hospitalization and there was a death of 14 uh, out of 151, so a death rate of 
Um, so when we look at the CDC data for a similar time period, breakthrough rate in the general population is quoted to be around 0.01%. So the transplant recipients did have significantly higher risk of breakthrough, uh, even though overall numbers uh, are small. It is important to note that this data is pre-Delta circulation, and I think uh, at least it, it seems, you know, by personal experience and talking to other centers that this potentially may be higher in the Delta era but I have not seen transplant specific papers to that effect. Next, please. So what do breakthroughs look like? There've been a number of case series that have been published. Some I've shown on this slide and a few on the next. In general, breakthrough infections are defined as COVID that occurs 14 days or so after vaccination in patients that receive two doses of mRNA vaccine or a single dose of the Janssen vaccine. Most of the studies here, uh, as well as on the next slide, note a median onset of symptomatic COVID-19 three to four weeks from the last vaccine dose. Our series uh, from UCSD is the outlier here, and we noted a median onset of almost 90 days. Two studies, so the Anjan et al. paper from Miami and then our uh, local paper from San Diego, found that almost half of our breakthrough cases had infected household members, most of whom were unvaccinated. Next, please. I would also like to point out the Khaled et al. paper of 55 kidney transplant recipients that had breakthrough infections. 25 of these patients underwent antibody testing uh, when they were diagnosed with COVID-19, 24 of whom had no detectable antibody response. Clinical outcomes in these papers has been quite variable with some series that show no deaths and 22% in the one cohort, which is the Tau et al. paper in AJT. My personal observation is that centers that report high rate of monoclonal antibody use, as noted uh, in both of these slides, also have minimal or zero deaths. And I think this is something Dr. Avery will be discussing uh, later. Next slide. So my take home message is one, vaccines do work in the solid organ transplant setting, but this response is suboptimal. It's important to assess both antibody as well as T cell response. And breakthrough infections are occurring, but generally, uh, again, reported for pre-Delta era seem to be less than 1% among vaccinated transplant recipients. Early use of monoclonal antibodies uh, may reduce the risk of hospitalization in these patients. And then at least two studies report temporal association with infected household members. And so I think um, it's really important for household members also to be vaccinated. And uh, to end, patients, solid organ transplant patients that are vaccinated should continue with risk mitigation strategies using masking, social distancing, et cetera. And I will end here. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Um, so I, I, it's a real honor to be able to talk today. I'll be talking about third doses and uh, I have no relevant conflict of interest to disclose. Now, here are some important considerations when interpreting third dose studies. First is that several studies have shown that third dose improves immunogenicity in transplant patients. And here I just uh, outlined three of the larger studies, but now there are several others that have been published as well. Some considerations to think about. One is that we don't know what the protective titer of antibody is. So we don't have a clear correlate of protection. And that also ties in, do we want protection from infection or is protection from severe disease enough? The other is type of vaccine. So Pfizer versus Moderna versus viral vector versus mix and match approaches. And I just note that the antigenic dose is different in Pfizer versus Moderna. The third is assays used to assess response. So in-house versus commercially available assays and what is the target of those assays? And then, as I mentioned, the threshold to define a response and the lack of a clear correlate. Neutralizing antibody determination is likely a better correlate of protection, but not done in many of the studies. T cell responses are also important and likely limit severity of disease. And then there's also the issue of delayed responsiveness. So many of the studies assess, assess response about a month after the third dose, but it's possible that antibody can continue to rise beyond that. And then finally, the effect of immunosuppression, transplant type, age, and comorbidities. Next slide. So I'm going to show you the data from our third dose uh, randomized control trial. So what we did was we took patients who had received two doses of the Moderna vaccine at the standard interval, 
and randomize them to receive either placebo or Moderna. Our primary outcome was an anti-RBD titer of greater than 100 units per ml, which we defined a priori based on both animal data as well as a, a number of studies in, uh, in human non-transplant cohorts, as well as data from our own transplant infected patients. Next slide. Next slide. So these were the characteristics of the patients. There were a slightly older cohort of transplant patients and uh, really a mix of transplant types. You can see there was some variability between the transplant types in the two arms, but the immunosuppression was actually pretty identical in the two arms, uh, mostly triple immunosuppression with a calcineurin inhibitor, prednisone and mycophenolate. Uh, you can see that the third dose anti-RBD uh, titers before the intervention were actually quite low. And we also did anti-NP testing to confirm absence of prior COVID infection. Next slide. So this is the primary response. So here on the left-hand side is a panel that shows the anti-RBD in placebo versus Moderna after the third dose. And using a threshold of greater than 100, you can see there's a 55% response rate in the third dose Moderna versus a 17.5% response rate in the placebo. And on the right-hand side, it just shows pre to post. And you can see in the, in the pink, the Moderna, there's a pretty significant rise in antibody. Whereas in the placebo, most people either stay the same, some go down, but interestingly enough, some do go up. And it was actually statistically significant. And it just sort of highlights the need for a placebo arm to determine true response. Next slide. This is the neutralization data. So we used a surrogate neutralization assay where greater than 30% could be considered a positive neutralization antibody detection. And that outcome was achieved in 60% of the Moderna versus 24.6% of the placebo, which was also very statistically significant. Next slide. We then looked at the T cell response and I just show the CD4 data here. And on the left hand side, is a single patient, and this is a post second dose and then post third dose. So the y axis here is interferon gamma, and the x axis is IL2. So you can see after the third dose, this patient had a very good, what we defined as a polyfunctional T cell response that was specific for SARS CoV 2 and expressing both interferon gamma and IL2. And then on the right hand side is uh, shown all the patients in aggregate. So each dot is an individual patient. And the y-axis shows the number of SARS-CoV-2 specific polyfunctional CD4 cells. And you can basically see that in the third dose Moderna group, there was about a five-fold higher uh, polyfunctional CD4 T cell response versus the placebo again, which was highly significant. Next slide. Uh, we looked at adverse events and overall the third dose was very well tolerated compared with placebo. There were no grade three or four adverse events. And importantly, there was no rejection episodes at both four weeks and three months post follow-up uh, and graph function remained quite stable at three months post follow-up. Next slide. Now this data, this data, I'll just, it's not published, so it's non-peer reviewed. So I'll just uh, uh, urge you to interpret with caution, but this shows neutralization against variants of concern. Again, this uses a surrogate neutralization assay, which with a threshold of greater than 30% should be considered a positive neutralization. And what you can see on the left-hand side, and this is post third dose Moderna, uh, just the Moderna arm, uh, you can see that the number of people who are positive is significantly less for all the variants versus wild type, but especially for the beta variant and the delta variant of uh, SARS-CoV-2. And then on the right-hand side, you can see uh, the same data, but versus placebo. So you can, so what it shows that even though the neutralization is less for all the variants of concern, the neutralization positivity is still higher than placebo. Uh, for all, all three variants tested. Next slide. So in summary, uh, a third dose of vaccine improves immune response and should be given to all transplant recipients. It's safe and well tolerated. Uh, the optimal timing and best type of vaccine is still unclear. Uh, 
And then there is clearly a subset of patients that won't respond to third dose and need alternative strategies. And I've just put a number of question marks here. So for example, there's some data with a fourth dose suggesting that if you have a little bit of response to third dose, you might have a slightly more response to fourth dose. But if you probably have no response to three doses, I don't think a fourth or fifth dose will help. Um, there uh, is not much data about mixing vaccine types, but that's an alternative strategy. Of course, vaccination of those around the transplant patient is very important and ongoing precautions. Robin will talk about monoclonals. Uh, immunosuppression adjustment has been raised by many people, but I'm not aware of any data specifically where they on purpose adjusted immunosuppression and then gave vaccine. And then I think the last strategy, which uh, may be a little bit provocative to think about is antivirals. And I think many of us saw the Molnupiravir data uh, looked quite promising, although not published yet, but a RCT showing a significant reduction in hospitalization and death. And this was given within the first five days as an oral antiviral. And you can, I think if it's like other antivirals, my bet is if you start it within the first 24 to 48 hours, it would really mitigate a lot of the morbidity and mortality. So you could, you could think of a strategy where a transplant patient may have access to a rapid test and then start antivirals within one to two days of symptoms as a way to mitigate disease rather than, than use other preventive strategies. So I'll end there and I will turn it over to Robin. And I just wanna thank the team and everybody. Thank you so much. I'm Robin Avery. I'm delighted to be here to talk to you today about monoclonal antibodies and other ways to protect transplant patients. My disclosures are shown on the next slide. I'm an investigator on a number of industry funded studies but I don't receive any personal financial remuneration. Next slide, please. As you heard from Dr. Aslam and Dr. Humar, the responses do improve with uh, increasing numbers of doses, including third dose of vaccine, but not everybody will have a demonstrable antibody response. So how do we protect this patient? This is a 67-year-old woman with a kidney transplant. She develops autoimmune cytopenia as a refractory to steroids and multiple other therapies, Finally, she responds to rituximab and it's determined that she needs to continue on this every four months. She has no COVID IgG antibodies after an mRNA vaccine series. Next, please. So as you heard, those three does increase the percentage of SOT who have antibody as quite elegantly uh, as shown by the previous speakers, but some still have no antibody response. In particular, we worry about severely B cell depleted patients. Rituximab in particular affects vaccine responses for six months or more, but other anti-B cell therapies have similar effects. And although different vaccine strategies will be studied in upcoming trials, including modulation of immunosuppression, additional doses and mix and match vaccines, uh, for example, the upcoming NIH funded CPAT multicenter trial, it's predicted that some of these patients still will not make antibodies or other immune responses to the vaccine. Next, please. So COVID-19 monoclonal antibodies have really uh, revolutionized, as you know, our treatment primarily of outpatients, but now with other expanding potential uses. In the US, the FDA has established an EOA for treatment. The criteria have been has to be outpatient, mild symptoms have to be within 10 days of start of symptoms and not hypoxemic. Uh, and then there's a more recent EOA for post-exposure prophylaxis. This is for high-risk people uh, high risk of progression of disease who either are household contacts, other close contacts as CDC defined, uh, or congregate living situations where they're exposed to someone with COVID. And in terms of the types of monoclonal antibodies we have used, first there was bamlanivimab, and then that was coupled with adesivimab. Um, imdevimab and casirivimab were combined together as the Regeneron monoclonal. And citrovimab uh, is another, um, well, it's a talk a little bit about the mechanism first. So the first four I mentioned bind to the receptor binding domain and interfere with binding to the human ACE2 receptor. The trover map has a little bit different binding site on the RBD uh, and does not interfere with ACE2 binding, but all of these have the effect of um, inhibiting the virus's life cycle and its ability to um, invade cells and perpetuate the infection. Next, please. 
And now we have quite a number of reports that monoclonal antibodies are effective for SOT treatment. I'll mention just a few studies here. I apologize for leaving others out due to time considerations. So Yetmar and colleagues reported on 73 SOT recipients, uh, three quarters of whom received famlanivimab and the others other monoclonals, and only nine or 12.3% of these were hospitalized and there were no deaths. Uh, Klein and colleagues reported on uh, 20 of 95 kidney recipients to receive monoclonal antibodies and found that hospitalizations and ER visits were only 15% versus 76%, which is highly significant. And Del Bello and colleagues reported on 16 SOT recipients out of 48 who met criteria to be treated with monoclonals and zero of those 16 versus almost half of the 32 uh, others developed severe respiratory illness requiring high oxygen support. Next, please. And in a large study uh, from UCSD, Dr. Aslam's group, uh, 175 out of 617 high-risk patients received monoclonals. These were not all uh, SOT, but included SOT. 83.4% received pasirivimab and devimab, and hospitalizations were really significantly reduced, 1.7% versus 24%, and deaths were zero versus 2.7%. So across multiple studies, it really does appear that this early treatment is extremely effective and it behooves us to educate our patients as well as create systems to make this happen rapidly. I just wanna mention parenthetically, there's another emerging use for monoclonal antibodies here. Uh, at our center, Veronica Diaverti and colleagues and I have treated seven severely B cell depleted patients who simply could not clear their SARS-CoV-2. Now these were not people that were acutely ill or intubated, but these were symptomatic patients who'd had COVID with low cycle thresholds, meaning active virus, for often two to two and a half months or more, these patients were treated with cathirivimab and devimab on emergency IND plus off-label remdesivir, and so far all of them have cleared. Next, please. So what about pre-exposure prophylaxis? Getting back to the question raised by our previous speakers, what is this potential perhaps for people who don't um, have antibody responses, even to third dose of vaccine? So recently we heard uh, top line results of the phase three trial of AZD7442, which is a combination long acting monoclonal antibody from AstraZeneca, reported to reduce symptomatic COVID by 77%. I will be interested in seeing the formal data when that's reported. Um, but we and others are hoping to, or helping to launch upcoming trials of casirivimab, indevimab, and citrovimab used for pre-exposure prophylaxis in immunocompromised patients without antibody responses to COVID vaccines. In other words, they wouldn't have to wait for a, a uh, exposure to someone with COVID in order to receive this protection. Now, advantages to this could include immediate presence of antibody. It doesn't require humoral immune system to manufacture it. But on the other hand, this does mean a need for redosing at an interval that's specific to that particular monoclonal. And uh, we'll see, may or may not be resilient to evolving variants. We've seen the uh, evolving story with famlanivimab, for example, when it was first introduced, it was highly effective. Then it could only be used with edisevimab. Then for a while it could not be used, but now is uh, making a comeback um, in certain localities based on the mix of particular variants that are circulating at that time. However, we think these upcoming studies should help to define the benefits and the target groups for prophylaxis, who, when, and for how long. And we're very excited about uh, this possibility. Next, please. What else can we do to protect transplant recipients? Um, I think we've all been convinced that vaccinating household contacts, caregivers, healthcare workers is really important. And we now have additional reasons to tell patients to report symptoms, exposures early, get tested early, so they can be treated with monoclonal antibodies or perhaps emerging um, uh, agents such as molnupiravir. At Hopkins, we have organized under the leadership of Willa Cochran, transplant ID nurse practitioner, an NP, a nurse-led initiative to streamline these monoclonal referrals. Uh, she's also been a champion for outpatient COVID management. Uh, and I think it's been highly effective in helping keep our patients well and out of the hospital. And again, we'd like to vaccinate pre-transplant when possible since multiple studies suggest that responses are better in those cases. Next, please. So I'd like to thank all of you and I would like to turn it over now to Dr. Eisen.
Thank you so much, and thanks for the opportunity to uh, talk today. <clears throat> I was asked to briefly discuss serologic testing, so the pros and cons. Next slide. These are my disclosures. Next slide. So <clears throat> while we've uh, been talking a lot about vaccines, we really have uh, uh, kind of talked uh, about both humoral and cellular responses that are generated uh, from the uh, vaccines. And while my focus is going to be on antibody titers, something we can measure relatively uh, easily, I think we can't forget the uh, cellular responses, which are critical in preventing severe disease, hospitalization, and death. <clears throat> Next slide. Um, the other thing that we have to keep in mind is a lot of people throw around a lot of opinions and terms related to measures of protection uh, for vaccination. Um, the two key measures that we uh, think of are efficacy, uh, which is in an ideal setting and effectiveness, which is based on real world conditions. And these are generally protection against symptomatic uh, laboratory confirmed infections. The other thing that we've talked glancingly about uh, in some of the prior slides is correlates of protection. And this is if you uh, know what the antibody titer or uh, cellular response level is in a patient, does that correlate with the inability of that individual to become uh, infected? And correlates of protection can really uh, be dependent on a number of things. Seroconversion, which many of the early studies focused on, which just really is saying, does a person have detectable antibodies or not? In healthy patients, this oftentimes correlates with uh, good responses. But as we've seen in our patients, uh, just because they've got a detectable antibody doesn't mean that it's at a level that likely will protect them. And this is where seroprotection is critically important to where we can uh, determine a antibody threshold where patients are clinically protected uh, from infections. And as we heard from uh, a tool, a little bit about neutralizing the antibody titers, which are really specific to the individual pathogen and may change as the, uh, the virus changes over time. And then lastly, uh, cellular immune assays, uh, which we've talked on, uh, talked with uh, as well. Next slide. So one of the big challenges is that the true seroprotective threshold hasn't been well defined. But there's been some great modeling work that's available in MedArchive um, that really tries to assess uh, what the uh, seroprotective titer is. And in the assays that they used, which uh, were uh, pseudovirus neutralization assays, this was somewhere between 100 and 1,000 international units per ml. Additionally, we're starting to see that uh, for protection against the Delta variant, you may need a higher titer uh, in these uh, individuals to protect uh, for infection, as was somewhat shown uh, in uh, tools uh, data, where we have even lower levels uh, of, uh, in our, some of our transplant patients. Second, all of the assays were developed uh, to, to screen for infection not to determine vaccine response. This is precisely why the FDA suggests not using them for that purpose. Not all assays give similar values. Some have a positive threshold of 0.8, 1, 10, uh, and they have a range that can be over maybe 10, 1 to 10 or 1 to 1,000. And so comparing results across assays is quite uh, challenging. Additionally, while there is a link um, uh, that the correlation between absolute titers and neutralizing titers isn't, as, isn't uh, well defined for all assays. Next slide. Uh, and so this really takes us uh, into the data that we've seen. If the threshold is 100, which is uh, what was uh, estimated uh, by the, the Toronto group, uh, you can see what our expected vaccine responses are. But if what's needed is a little higher, 500 or 1,000 uh, units per ml, uh, we have a larger proportion of patients uh, that may not be protected. And this is important because if we tell them they're protected with serology and they're not, they can uh, undertake uh, risky behavior. Next slide. And uh, neutralizing antibodies uh, uh, definitely may be affected by this. In one study uh, from the uh, Hopkins group, they showed uh, against Delta, they had much lower antibody titers. Uh, we saw earlier today that this appears to be the case uh, for uh, the, the study from uh, the uh, Toronto group as well. Again, a large number of people are, have protection and this is improved with a third dose, but it may not be universal to all. Next slide. And so this takes me to kind of where I uh, fall down. Serologies are great for research, and they give you something to do, but I don't think you should be doing it. 
and it, they don't really have a role in clinical practice. Next slide. Uh, serology doesn't guide decisions for vaccine in most countries or boosters. It's not a tighter determined uh, boost. Uh, there is more to protection than just antibodies. Uh, you've got the entire cellular response. And both a positive or negative result could mislead a patient to thinking they didn't get a result or they did when they do have some degree of protection. There's no seroprotective uh, threshold, so telling a patient they're protected uh, by an assay doesn't really uh, hold necessarily true. There's variability across assays. Some uh, that uh, look at the nucleoprotein, for example, won't show any response even if a patient has been vaccinated. And then it gets to the question, what are our goals in, in looking at this? And we really, our goal of vaccination is to prevent infection, hospitalization, and death. Next slide. And as uh, uh, Saima showed earlier, we are seeing some evidence of protection. May not be uh, absolutely perfect and something that we can improve on through changes, uh, uh, through other vaccines or even approaches as uh, Robin put together. But really in the end, this is the data that we should be focusing on. Can we do better? Yes. But checking serology on everyone is not the solution. Thank you. Hello, and thank you for the invitation to speak um, to a transplant community. I'll be speaking on mandating vaccines, the pros and the cons. Uh, controversial topic. Uh, next slide, please. In evaluating whether or not we should be undertaking um, the mandate for vaccines, we at least need to start with the rationale. As you've heard from many of the speakers prior, uh, there are variable responses within uh, the transplant uh, population and pre-transplant population. Uh, notably, uh, post-transplant patients are immunocompromised and therefore, in general, are vulnerable to viral infections. Uh, SARS-CoV-2 is a virus that uh, infects uh, everyone, uh, has the potential to infect everyone uh, in varying communities. Uh, Weightless waitlisted patients that are infected with CoV-2 uh, may be at increased risk for severe illness and mortality. And I'll present that data uh, upcoming shortly. Unvaccinated transplant recipients uh, may have increased risk of severe or fatal illness. Now, this uh, is something that it all depends on the uh, type of organ uh, that is being transplanted. Immune response to COVID-19 uh, vaccine are more, uh, tend to be more robust in the pre-transplant setting. And there's a emerging uh, clinical uh, data that suggests that this is the case. Next slide, please. In a uh, paper by uh, Miller et al. Uh, that came out earlier, uh, both in February and then again in uh, June, we looked at SRTR data that uh, started after, that compared uh, before the national emergency was declared on March 13, 2020, and after to see uh, what, whether or not there was increase in mortality on the wait list. As you can see, it's uh, quite heterogeneous uh, in terms of uh, the uh, data. Uh, and it depends on the type of organ uh, that is transplanted. What is noted is that there was an increase uh, in uh, mortality uh, in the kidney transplant uh, population. And this depended on uh, things such as donor specific, uh, when they looked at donor specific areas, you could see that areas that had much greater uh, outbreaks had higher uh, adjusted uh, hazard ratio. Take for instance, New, New York, at the time uh, that this study uh, looked at, had as high as 2.52, uh, hazard ratio in New Jersey, where I am at 1.84, Michigan, which we know had a notable breakout uh, at 1.56. And this also very dependent on ethnicity. Blacks greater than uh, whites were shown to have higher uh, hazard ratio and increased mortality rate across the board. Uh, next slide, please. So there's other effects as well for uh, that on the overall healthcare system that has really caused this pandemic to extend beyond many of the early projections and uh, continue to have an ongoing effect. And a universal uh, vaccination uh, campaign, and in some cases mandate, is a way to really 
get at the underlying problem and some of the issues. There's obviously things such as diminished uh, loss of capacity whenever COVID uh, is in an affected area. And now that we see a Delta variant and renewed uh, spikes in certain specific areas, this is clear. Uh, many anecdotal, uh, as well as other reports of you know, burnout, illness, depression, et cetera, uh, is occurred due to this uh, ongoing pandemic. It's also directly affecting care in specific areas. Uh, anecdotally, I'm on the ASTS uh, COVID task force, and uh, just uh, which represents a lot of different regions uh, throughout US, the US, and we get reports uh, of whenever there's a uh, increase in terms of the prevalence of COVID in a specific area that capacity is affected. So we now cannot, some places are not able to uh, transplant uh, uh, in a timely fashion, as we know that that in itself has an effect on mortality and morbidity. Uh, there is a decrease in deceased donor transplantation if there's no ICU that's available, if there's lack of staff. And in some cases, living donor transplantation uh, is delayed because of, again, the capacity uh, and the loss of capacity in these areas that uh, are affected. Uh, next slide, please. So the pros uh, would be reduced morbidity and mortality uh, of uh, COVID, uh, this, uh, of SARS COVID-2 infection, the post-transplant patient, uh, reduction of severe illness and mortality on the wait list, uh, Giving vaccines in the pre-transplant uh, setting, there's obviously, uh, there is good data to suggest that there is a uh, improved response in the pre-transplant setting uh, with some caveats, obviously as previously uh, mentioned by other speakers that those who have either T or B cell ablative therapy after uh, transplant may not necessarily uh, get a good response. But in general, uh, just like in the general population, um, a good resp uh, vaccines will uh, uh, increase the immune response uh, and that is protective. Uh, I think uh, of note in general, in principle, uh, this is a part of being good stewards of a very scarce uh, resource. And that is the donor organ. And we are asked to do this. And by uh, increasing protection to the transplant recipients, uh, this is part of the mandate in itself that we are charged with. And this, uh, by our uh, community, uh, making sure that we uh, increase the rate of uh, vaccination and increasing uh, the uh, overall universal um, uh, campaign for increasing vaccination that we are in, in, along with the general trend in our society. Next slide, please. The cons. Obviously, vaccines, COVID, have, uh, in general, this pandemic has been uh, one that has been politically polarizing. And certainly, there's always a fear anytime that you mention mandates that there is going to be political uh, blowback. And that uh, is actually even regional. Certainly, uh, areas that were affected significantly uh, have had uh, less of a pushback, but there are centers that have already taken uh, this step. And it, uh, it's something that has to be determined, uh, you know, depending on the, the context regionally. Some patients are unwilling to comply with a mandate. And this may mean that they no longer want to be transplanted at a given center if this is one of the demands that is being made. Uh, vaccination hesitancy among staff uh, may be an issue. And in some places you hear of uh, isolated attempts at uh, lawsuits and so forth. And this may actually affect the uh, ability to uh, run the transplant program if this is the case at a program that requires mandates. That being said, many hospital systems now are moving more toward mandates in general for staff, not necessarily those that are um, doing transplantation. Next slide. So in general, our recommendation uh, 
would be that universal vaccination is the most effective means to diminish uh, severity of, and, of the disease uh, and relieve the impact on the healthcare uh, system. Uh, all the, the pre-transplant uh, candidates should be vaccinated if possible against SARS-CoV-2 uh, and uh, those in close contact as well. The transplant program should do everything to be able to, to, uh, possible to uh, contact candidates and the recipients through determine their vaccination status and then move towards getting universal vaccinations. Next slide. Thank you, Dr. Brown, and uh, thank you to all the panelists for these wonderful talks that we just had for the second section on vaccines. This was truly an outstanding set of speakers with uh, um, a lot of incredible information and guidance uh, um, for the transplant community. For the next several minutes, we have the opportunity to ask the panelists some questions, and Dipali and I will take turns. Um, I will start with a, with a question for uh, Dr. Aslam, um, and I'll be looking at the, the audience as well for some great questions. So, so Simon, someone in the audience was asking about what, as you were looking through the data on breakthrough infections, granted this was after two doses and uh, in some ways pre-Delta, but um, what kind of subgroups uh, within the transplant recipient population uh, were found to be particularly a higher risk for breakthrough infections and perhaps poor outcomes. Um, I know that you mentioned briefly some of these risk factors. Um, I, I guess I'll be also be looking at perhaps if we're able to see different platforms creating sort of different risk levels for breakthrough or time from transplantation as well. Okay, well, thank you for that question. So in the study that we did, we we didn't really have, you only had 12 breakthroughs um, and among about 2000 patients. So with that, we did not have enough definitions in between groups to really tease out who was at risk. Um, we do sort of look at our patients. It's not an age thing. So just within the 12, you know, the age is variable from mid thirties to sixties. Um, you know, both mRNA vaccines were among breakthrough uh -huh. patients. So I think, you know, one, we saw very few breakthroughs, but because it was so few and the single center study, we weren't really able to tease out risk factors for those breakthroughs. So I think it would be really nice, you know, if, if we can do this in a multi-center way to kind of tease that out. But important to note that we did not check antibody levels in, those pati in any of patients in this study. And and Saima, can I just clarify a lot of these breakthroughs that you presented are pre-Delta variant? Um, yes. So everything that I presented was pre-Delta. Um, and we do have, I mean, we're now looking, I haven't presented, but we do have more recent cases that include the Delta variant as well. Um, and in general, we're seeing more breakthrough with Delta, but this hasn't been analyzed or presented yet. Fair enough. So um, my next question is really for, um, Actually, it could be for any of the panelists, but uh, maybe we'll start with Robin. Um, Robin, can you tell us a little bit about um, modulating immunosuppression, especially mycophenolate? Um, you know, I've had patients ask me whether they should stop their mycophenolate temporarily in order for them to get a good vaccine response. Um, and I'm never sure what to what to say to that. Um, are there should we be doing this uh, clinically? Should we be doing this in trials? Should we really pursue this as a trial? Yeah, thank you, Deepali. That's a great question. So uh, it's an association that's well established, both from our group at Hopkins with both the first and second dose papers, and now multiple groups from other centers, uh, in most cases have confirmed that being on an anti-metabolite, particularly mycophenolate, is associated with lower vaccine responses. However, what we don't know is in any given patient's case, whether reducing or holding MMF and for what period of time makes a difference. And clearly the risk benefit balance is different for each patient. There are some clinicians around um, uh, different centers who've started doing this with their patients that they consider to be at not such high risk uh, for holding that. 
And again, more data are weighted. The upcoming NIH CPAT um, multi-center study, as well as other studies, hopefully will shed more light on who benefits uh, for how long before, how long after. But we are telling our patients to please not alter their transplant immunosuppression without discussing and conferring with their transplant clinicians. Great. Thank you, Robin. The next question will be for Dr. Humar Atul. Um, great presentation, and thank you so much for your leadership in, in the studies leading to uh, um, an additional dose for mRNA vaccine for our transplant patients. So I know that we are reluctant in, in recommending serology testing post-vaccination to our patients, exactly for the reasons that Mike had uh, outlined. Um, nevertheless, those are being checked by, by many providers, and uh, a, a big question for transplant infectious disease providers in particular is what to do with those patients who have a low antibody response, depending on whatever serological assay they may use, um, what, what to do about those low responses after the third dose? Are you in Canada giving a fourth dose or looking yeah. for additional uh, um, interventions like you outlined? Yeah, it's a good, it's a good question, Mark, because in fact, I get many of those patients asking me that exact same question. And honestly, I'm not sure what to do. So what I advise the patients currently is that if you haven't responded at all to three doses, you're probably not going to have much of a response to a fourth dose. Uh, if you have a little bit of response, you could get a fourth dose if you wanted to, but we're not routinely recommending is what I tell patients. I ask them to all just take precautions, be extra careful, you know, with the usual masking and avoiding crowds and, and all that stuff. And then I also ask them to make sure they're on the lookout for symptoms and make sure they get diagnosed like as soon as they get symptoms, because I really think if we can make an early diagnosis in these patients and intervene uh, currently with monoclonals and then maybe with antivirals in the future, uh, we're going to mitigate a lot of the morbidity and mortality associated with this. Um, I have a question for Mike. Um, Mike, with regards to a serology, I, you know, the gist of what you mentioned was that we really should not be telling patients to check serology. But in reality, um, there are a lot of patients who have gone out and tested, um, you know, gone out and gotten serology tests. And the argument that I get from patients is that, isn't it better for me to know that I am negative so that I can be super careful? Um, isn't, that, isn't that good information, even if we're not really, um, you know, making a lot of changes from it? Isn't it good information for patients to know if they're negative? I think that the easy answer is, I think all of us would recommend all of our patients, whether they have a great response or not, still need to take extra care as uh, uh, transplant patients. They need to continue to mask. They need to continue to be uh, cautious. And when I talk to these patients, I, I highlight the fact that just because they have a positive result doesn't mean that they shouldn't be doing um, the things that they are being cautious about. And so you shouldn't need the serology test to know that you need to take extra extra precautions. Uh, and this will be true over time if we have new, newer, worse variants than Delta, or as we've seen uh, titers wane over time, uh, you know, a year from now when we're talking about do people need a booster or not, uh, at that point, uh, the, the facts will still be the case. Great. Um, next question for Dr. Brown, Lloyd. Um, I think you were assigned the uh, perhaps the thorniest of the uh, topics um, in terms of vaccine requirements. Um, what do you think about recent news or reports that, for example, vaccine requirements for healthcare workers here in New York or for uh, um, um, teachers and, and those in sort of the, the school system in terms of being mandated? And that actually that did seem to push a lot of um, those who were standing, you know, sitting on the fence to do to get vaccinated. Um, what do you think about those reports and how it would translate for patients on the wait list who remain hesitant or concerned as well? Right. Um, as I often do, even in a clinical setting, I remind uh, everyone that the word pan means all. Uh, so we're in a pandemic. So that includes everyone. And so anything that encourages everyone to uh, take some action towards uh, uh, alleviating the effects of this pandemic is uh, appropriate. 
I mean, there is some precedence, right? The, uh, the flu vaccine in many uh, centers have been a requirement in, in order um, uh, to be able to participate, whether in work or school or other uh, institutions. So it's not unreasonable from that standpoint. I think people are getting it. I think some of the fears that have been alleviated by, of course, are uh, some vaccines uh, being FDA approved. And so that excuse that uh, it's experimental and not validated and so forth is uh, uh, is going by the wayside and the resistance is waning now that we have over 150, 160 million people here in the U.S. that have gotten the vaccine. Um, so I think mandating in, in one way of also setting a tone and saying, you know, we are serious, this is serious. You've seen how long this thing has uh, persisted and we need to move on. So I think that's the message that's being put out, I think. So, so Lloyd, can we extrapolate some of these principles to living donors and mandating vaccines for living donors before they donate? Sure, I mean, the living donor um, is part of that group that is quite proximate to the recipient, number one, oftentimes. Um, and, you know, there are, the data is, doesn't suggest that living donors are who get uh, COVID after they've donated necessarily are in worse uh, shape, but it's certainly something that uh, one can err on the side of caution in terms of uh, encouraging vaccination in, in living donor, donors. Uh, that is something that initially was uh, a sticking point for individuals to get uh, to even go ahead and donate. This may be something that allows that to occur uh, with um, more ease if individuals know that they've been protected, it's safe, and can go ahead and, and donate. But I think in general, the, you know, the donor and the recipient as a group uh, is part of the same group and should uh, be both vaccinated. So I, you know, I, I just want to ask the panelists what they think about um, Molnupiravir, uh, because that's sort of the, you know, there's been a press release of that, and um, I, I just want to quickly go around and and just get your thoughts on, um, you know, how we could potentially use this, um, and I'll start with Mike. Mike, what do you think about that data? So I think you have to be very careful about what you use it for. I think as a tool outlined where someone's sick and it's uh, uh, they're presenting early, using it as early treatment. Prophylaxis without studies, I would not do. It re will require taking a pill over the long run and there's always concern for resistance emergence, which would make me a bit nervous. Um, the other thing I think to, to keep in mind is, again, these aren't head-to-head -head data, but we saw a 50% reduction in hospitalization with monopiravir and 71% reduction with monoclonal antibodies. So I, I, the, the real question is, should you use both uh, in our high-risk populations? Yeah. Robin, any comments on monopiravir? Yeah, I think it's really exciting. And I think it's great to have something that's oral outpatient with that kind of potential. So I look forward to more data and uh, alone and in combination. Great. Uh, Saima, any, any, any thoughts that you have about um, monoclonals versus molnupiravir versus other things to protect our patients? Because I, I, you know, there are some um, patients on the on the call, I'm, I'm wondering what you would advise patients, um, you know, in terms think, of keeping themselves protected. So, I mean, keeping protected, I think, you know, definitely vaccination as well as, you know, risk mitigation. For my patients, I talk about, you know, you're vaccinated, it's fine to meet other, you know, vaccinated people in an outside setting, um, but indoors to be wearing masks. Um, so, but in terms of molnupiravir versus monoclonal antibody, I think the math data is so much stronger in terms of preventing hospitalization. And there's so much more accumulated data, especially in the transplant patients. So I feel like early diagnosis is key. Ideally, you know, get MAB ASAP um, and potentially add on uh, antiviral, but that, you know, the data remains to be seen if it's even worth adding on or not. Okay. Other thing quickly, just that 
the, we, along those lines is there were signals for neutropenia uh, in some of the preclinical data um, with molnupiravir. And so whether that's more with our patients that are on things like uh, on MMF and that, again, something we need to gain experience with. Great. So um, I think we're at time and um, I will um, close the session then. I, I want to thank you uh, very much to all our speakers for these fantastic talks. Um, I, I want to thank the AST staff, Brian Valeria, uh, Melissa Patterson, and Chad Waller for putting uh, this together. And um, to all the societies for coming together and, and uh, putting together this great session. And thank you all of you for attending. And I hope this has been very helpful as uh, you navigate the pandemic and uh, try to provide the best care for our patients. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you.